going to talk about Christ today. We're going to talk about hope. I've done two lessons on hope recently. I want to pick up from that because it's such an important idea, hope. We need to first of all understand what hope is because it's kind of confusing. Uh, the Greek word elpis, if you'll look up at the top here, the means... It doesn't mean hope as we think of it. Oh, I hope so. It's like a wish that we, quote, hope happens. It's much stronger. It's a word that means expectation. And, and we all know how important expectations are. You know, if you enter into some relationship expecting, expecting it to be one way and it's another way, that's called marriage. Uh, Am I right? Yeah, it is. It's not ever what you think it is, especially if you've never done it before. So expectations really program what you're looking for in your life. And when you don't find it, often we react. We can become disappointed, disillusioned. And when you get disillusioned, this is connected to this study, you can begin to wonder if God's promises are real or are they true? You see, for thousands of years after Genesis 3, God's promise of a coming Savior, someone who would come and deal with a sin issue, lay unfulfilled. Unfulfilled. Often what we're looking for in our life is unfulfilled. I love the passage in Hebrews where he says, and all of these Strived in their faith, never receiving what had been promised. Never receiving. Isn't that encouraging? You're going to strive your whole life and not get what you were looking for. But he said the next life, they're going to get an abundance of reward for their striving in faith. But hope means to be confident, means to expect you know what's coming. You know what to look for. So it's a mental image of future events or expectations. Now, hope is really the other side of the coin from faith. Because logically speaking, and you, all, and you almost very often find faith and hope put together. Faith, hope, love, you know that passage. But whatever you believe to be true is what you expect to happen, right? If what you're expecting to happen is not happening, what does that tell you about your beliefs? That you've got them skewed, that you need some belief rehabilitation. You need some belief transformation, really. So expectations are a really, really important thing to to notice and be aware of in your life because if you're wise the more the longer you go the wiser you get to walk into a situation Gary walks into a school he already knows there's a uh, uh, an array of scenarios that are possible you know they're going to welcome him they're going to be wary about him they're going to reject him they're going to run him off with shotguns whatever he knows and he's already prepared and he knows what to expect so, that's hope. Now, in Ephesians 1.18, the way I get this mental image, Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart, your ability to see with your mind, uh, can be given light so that you may know or, or be able to see what we can safely expect because of who we are in Christ. He said, I want you to be able to see and know the hope of his calling." This idea of his calling is everything we receive in Christ. That's what we're called to. Now, that's quite a lot. So let me ask you a question. What, where is your mind normally focused? Are you normally focused on the negatives, on what's not happened for you, or what's wrong in your life, or what's not working the way you expect? I mean, are you, that would be the sin nature. That would be normal to be, to be bent in that direction. But listen, 
as a believer with the Holy Spirit, with the Word of God in your soul, you have an option. You have an option to say no to that, even to delete that or erase that, if you're mindful of it, but to focus your mind on the hope of His calling, the riches of His glory, the power that's in us. Ephesians chapter 1 to 2. So, where is your mind focused? What are you seeing in your mind and what are you focusing on? Christmas time, look, it, you know, I'm way beyond focusing on gifts. I sometimes focus on the money that's going to buy the gifts or the lack thereof, but it's about the Lord. And so we should be mature enough to take this time of year and use it to, to retrain our minds to focus on what's important, on what's right, on what's good, on what's... Listen, we've got so much blessing, and it's not even... Listen, Paul says it's a down payment. It's like escrow money, 10% of what we're going to get. Your experience with the Holy Spirit is just a fraction of what's coming. Now, can you look at that? Can you create that image as you see it in your mind and look at that and focus on that and allow that to impact your emotions and your temperament and your day-to-day -day living? You bet you can. Can you not? Yes. Nod your head yes. Yes, absolutely. So this is hope. Uh, Romans 4, 5, 4, and 5 talks about future expectation in Christ is developed. It's not just automatic. You have to develop this, just like muscle. You develop the, look, you have to break the old habits of going to the negative. Immediately you walk in and you're focused on what's wrong or what hasn't been done. I mean, you didn't speak to me today or the way you spoke to me or what you did to me, you know, okay, yeah, sure, all that's true. But is that where you live? Is that how you relate? Is that what you give to each other in your life? I mean, is that what you give to the people that are the closest to you, that do the most for you, that give, the, give everything they have to you, that can't do any more if they wanted to? Is that how you treat them? Is, is focus on what they haven't done for you or what they did that you didn't like? So easy to do. How do you live like that, though? Look, that's a, that's a life of misery. We don't have to do that. You can, you can look away from that. So, you develop it. Ephesians 1.14, he says, again, the experience of the Holy Spirit is given as a down payment of eternal blessing for our redemption. What we experience as believers in time is just a small part of the whole which will be given when Christ returns, when we are rewarded, when we're evaluated at the judgment seat of Christ and our rewards are issued. Hebrews 6, 18 and 19, what a, what a passage. He talks about having hope or confidence in God's eternal will and his oath. He said there's, God gave us two things that we're to use as an anchor for the soul. First is his eternal purpose, the plan of God. And the second is the oath that went along with it, i.e. his word. His plan and his word become the anchor. Become the anchor. Now, sometimes in life, people just want to go to church and, and feel good. I'm not opposed. I think that's a great thing to feel good. I'd rather feel good than feel bad, right? Now, listen, I'm talking to myself here. Because nobody's grumpier than I am. Y'all may have noticed that over the years, but sorry. I, I apologize that I'm grumpy, but I'm working on it. But I have, I have God's promise, his, his oath. He took an oath. You know, he, took a, he swore by himself because he couldn't find anybody bigger and stronger and more reliable than himself. That, that his plan and his word are immutable. They do not change. They're the anchor by which you hold on through all the storms of life. And finally, 1 Peter, Peter says, 
Keep your mind prepared. Remain focused. Set your hope or your confidence on the grace to be given when he appears, i.e. all the rest, the other 90% of what's coming. The 10 we have now, the 90 that's coming. Set your mind, visualize and focus on what's coming, the good stuff that's coming. Now, you got that? Were you with me? Good. Let's talk about hopelessness. The world is in a hopeless place. I mean, no wonder we're at each other's throats. Um, I've been listening to some interesting discussions about why politics runs the way it does and why there's cycles of his, historical trends and cycles. You know, you may have heard that term before. But, Man's hopeless situation, Adam's sin destroyed our created righteousness, causing all of us to be born unrighteous behind the barrier of the 13 judicial charges and under God's judgment. You're born under that. His sin also corrupted our flesh with a sin nature, causing us to be self-centered rather than God-centered. God is the center of all. The plan runs around, it, it, it's all, everything's l linked into him. But we see life as hooked into us. It's about, it's about me. You know, when the right light turns red, you're furious because it didn't stay green for you. So just a personal example there. Uh, man is born spiritually dead. Now, uh, let me just give you a, my litany of, of hopeless situations. Man is born spiritually dead, separated from God, unable to connect with God or his truth, incapable of knowing him or obeying him, knowing nothing, having needs only God can fulfill, with a sin nature under the authority of sinful parents, influenced by sinful peers, Absorbing the values of the world is our initial belief system, and it's hard to imagine being in a more desperate, helpless, or hopeless situation. That's pretty bad stuff, huh? That's who we are and what we're characterized by in our first birth before salvation. That is a desperate situation. To die without Christ, whoa, 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 whoa. Crazy. Insane, stupid, stupid. Tell him, Gary. Let me summarize. Genesis 3 talks about the devil's poisonous lies that the woman believed. Then she influenced her husband. Not necessarily, he didn't believe the lies, but he ate the fruit. And they lost everything of value. Everything. Their relationship, which, which had been initially a great blessing, now became a source of conflict. They became very vulnerable. I mean, they're, they became self-conscious. They became aware. And they realized they were naked and totally vulnerable. They, they instinctively covered up. That's what that was all about. And they were, where they had been totally open and intimate with each other, they now had to keep a mask. Had to keep a mask. Do you let people know you? Do you know you? Do you know your self inside? Do you let anybody else in? You know, listen, ultimately it's God. It's God. But he also designed a mate, family, to be part of your life, to be, more, be intimate with you, so don't stay guarded all your life. Just a little, no extra charge for that one. But let's summarize the predicament. The devil's lies, they lost everything. God's promise of redemption, right in Genesis 3, 15. He said the seed of the woman, which woman don't have a seed. Uh, he uses the word, in the Greek, it's the word sperma. So it's the idea of progeny, of, of, a, of a son, uh, will crush the head of the serpent who lied to the woman in the, in the first place. You know, let me ask you a question. 
What's the devil doing in the Garden of Eden tricking the woman anyway? What benefit does he get out of that? Well, ultimately, it's part of the angelic conflict. He's trying to get out of his judgment. You got to, it's kind of a complicated situation. But anyway, nobody else besides this church and those like it have ever had an answer to that question. What's up with the devil? Who's the devil and what's he doing? The angelic conflict explains so many things. Now, we lost our righteousness that was created from God. We're born disconnected from God and truth. The only truth we can hear as an unbeliever is divine establishment principle. Common sense. Morality. Common sense. Being a good person. A lot of people think that's Christianity. Being a good person. Nothing farther from the truth. We're, and listen, in this situation we're in, we're unable to pay for our own redemption. We can't get out of this. Our flesh is corrupted so that our day-to-day -day living is corrupted. Our thinking is corrupted. Our ideas are corrupted. And I'm going to share that with you in just a minute. How science has proven the Bible to be true. Now, all human souls were unrighteous, worthy to be condemned, and unable to escape the condemnation. All human bodies are corrupted, passing the sin nature to every generation. And listen, it, we're, we're incapable of being sinless. We can't, there's nobody can live and be sinless except one. That's impeccability. So, 1 Thessalonians 4.13, we do not want you to be uninformed or ignorant, fellow believers, about those who have died that you may not grieve as do the rest of the world who have no hope. This situation is no hope. Hopeless. You know what happens when you get hopeless? When you give up your hope? When you give up your confidence about the future? When you focus on negative images of your future? You know what happens? You get depressed. You get disappointed about life because your expectations are way out of whack. Nothing can, you can't be pleased. You want too much. You want the wrong thing. So you get all disappointed, and if nothing ever resolves, you get end up disillusioned. You're like, and listen, the last person you want to look at and blame is who? Me. You're going to blame God. You're going to blame the Bible so hard. You're going to blame your wife, your husband. You're going to blame somebody but yourself. Couldn't be me. My ideas must be correct. Does that sound familiar? Now, life without hope. From the Garden of Eden to the birth of Christ, they looked forward to his coming. Peter's going to tell us that after such a long time, people begin to say, it's not going to happen. Just like they say that about his second, uh, that's not going to happen. That's ridiculous. That's something somebody in the first century told you to motivate you to give money to the church. Well, that's certainly what we do around here, isn't it? We, we whoop on you good to give money to the church. Just teasing, we don't. We don't ask for money. Did you know, huh, when I got my counseling degree and I said, I'm going to have a counseling ministry, which I've had a pretty good one so far, I tried initially to charge for it. I mean, I, I, I spent a bunch of money still paying it off to go to school to get a master's degree to be able to do this and be educated about it. And I thought, well, that's not only fair that people pay to be able to pay for that, but I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. So I just said, forget it. I'll do it for free. I'll give it to you because God gave it to me. And if you want to contribute, more power to you. So God has provided our living through that ministry for years. We don't ask for money, and I'm not appealing to you now. I'm just telling you, this is how God works. This is how God works. He takes care of his own. He will. I have, listen, I have an image. Now, it's easily tempting 
to go over here and go, all right, well, I don't have a bunch of retirement money. I don't have a lot of Social Security money. I maybe don't have a lot of this. My body's going to pot right quick, and who knows what's going to happen. And I go over here, and God said, look, showers of blessing just coming out of the sky, coming out of the sky. So, now, hope. From the promise of Genesis 3.15 until his birth, the Old Testament prophets who knew what was going on were metaphorically holding their breath, waiting on his appearance, seeking hungrily to know. 1 Peter 1.10, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful search and inquiry. Hungrily seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicated about his birth and his life. Who was he going to be as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow? Here's the point. All of that time, boom, when he was born, a big excitement happened. Big excitement. God's plan began in eternity past Look how long the father waited. Of course, he, he keeps himself entertained. I understand he doesn't get bored, and he's a pretty happy guy. Uh, 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10, it talks about he who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Here's the point. This thing started way back here. Angels have been watching this all along the way. There was an angelic revolt. There was a trial. There was an appeal. There was the creation of human beings, and all down we're waiting on the redemption, the paying for the sins that had to happen, or we're all doomed. And here he is, and everybody goes, wow, wow. Hope. Our hope is renewed. You ever had your hope renewed? You know, you wait a long time on something and you know things aren't going well. You think, gosh, this is never going to happen. This is never going to happen. And one day God sends you a love letter in the form of a circumstance that comes along and you're like, wow, it's about to happen. About to happen. So, he says, well, I, I didn't finish reading that, did I? He's from all eternity, but now, here's the point, but now has been manifested by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. You have life and immortality. You're going to live forever. You're going to live forever in a state of perfection, in a state of bliss, with all the blessings you could ever imagine. You're not going to ever be able to count them all. They're just going to multiply as you... Count, you know, you count to a 1,000 and there's 10,000 more just multiplied into your life. Now, I don't really know how that's going to work. I know it's going to be a good deal. It's going to be a good deal. Listen, it's a good deal now. You already have it. Not, not in your grasp, but you already have it. So, now, his birth announcement had great excitement and drama associated with it, and it was marking the fact that God kept his promise. All through history, people had gotten tired of waiting. I don't think it's ever going to happen. Is you sure we understood that prophecy right? Are you sure we understand this? Of course, they really misunderstood a lot. They thought he was coming. Of course, it's there. it was what they were given. They thought he was coming to be a ruler on the earth which will happen in the millennium. So that's why they had such a difficult time understanding his message of being crucified and rising from the dead. They're like, Peter really struggled with that. So, but the day he was born, angelic choir, I mean, that'd be enough to scare you to death. Shepherds in the field, and these angels appear and start singing. You know, that was probably a pretty song. Uh, they go to the temple, and there's Anna and Simeon that understand who he is. And they're like, how does this happen? 
And the wise men brought gifts that prepared them for the trip to Egypt. So there was drama, the killing of all the two-year-olds and under. So the primary response of human history uh, where this promise had been withheld for thousands of years and he had finally arrived. Listen, what are you waiting on? What are you waiting on? You waiting on your marriage to get better? You waiting on issues within there to be resolved? You can start on that today. It's, it's a process. It's a learning. It's a giving up. It's a changing. It's a development. It's a transformation to make it work. But you can start on it today. Listen, Rhonda and I, we will, <laughs> of course, we, we have the perfect marriage. Uh, of course, we, half of it's perfect. Uh, anyway, we, you're welcome to come and visit with us. We will help you. We will help you. We can help you. Um, the forces of evil pulled out all the stops trying to kill him. They went to Egypt. Uh, all the heartache that evil can produce, <laughs> listen, this is the greatest thing ever. Everything the devil can produce, God turns into good for the sake of the believer. He just turns it right around and turns it into good for you. But, but look, we're over here looking at the circumstances, all heartache, all broke up, all worried, all fearful, fearful about everything. Fearful. Fearful. When, look, the story's already written. It's already written. We win. Did you know that? Just like SEC championship. Can't hold them back. We win. You got that? We win. Look at the win. Look at the victory. Look at the spoils. Focus on that. See it in your mind. So, his arrival had been anticipated for thousands of years. The fulfillment was glorious. We now anticipate a second arrival when his glory will be fully expressed. Now, science continues to progress. Of course, scientists don't know what they're looking at. They all attribute it to different things, but they continue to verify and validate all biblical concepts. Science just validates the Bible all over the place. Of course, for instance, MRI imaging. Tony can probably tell you a lot about that. MRI imaging has gotten so much better. They have now discovered, they used to think that when a baby was born, look, right before a baby's born, their brain flushes with a zillion neurons just waiting and ready to turn into some kind of idea, thought. They can build and develop. But they used to think that all of that was just came from life after birth, that you developed all of that, those neural pathways. You understand neural pathways? You mean, you know, you, okay, if you don't, look, your brain, all the neurons, as you think thoughts, they hook up with one another and they create what's called highways. And the more you use that particular connection of new, neurons, the stronger and the more habitual becomes a habit. Circumstance, automatic. They've discovered that at birth, these little babies already have neural highways ready built, pre-designed to produce specific behaviors. Now they say, oh, that's evolution. No, it's the inheritance of the sin nature where you inherit from your family tendencies toward being lascivious or being ascetic or certain behaviors, you inherit this stuff. You start out with those highways pre-built so that when circumstances come along, it's so easy for you to automatically go that way. I mean, why did you, why did one guy, I mean, <laughs> why did my brother, become ascetic, OCD, and I became lascivious. I'm not going to tell you what that meant, but 
just was a natural thing. That's just what I, I just naturally did it. I naturally did it. I inherited it from my bootlegger mama's side of the family. So here's the point. Here's the point. Fallen man is born with pre-designed neural pathways based on inherited tendencies. You, you inherit your sin nature trends and tendencies from your family. We begin with our brain pre-wired to follow in our ancestors' paths of sinfulness. Now, that can either be asceticism, which looks good, but it's just as sinful as lascivious sins. I was talking to somebody. They were talking about how their husband has anger and lashes out with anger. And then somebody else was talking about how their their partner withdraws, saying the withdrawal is better than the harshness. And I said, where do you get that? How do you see that any different? Just different form of the same thing. Just as hurtful to the other person. But we're born set up for this. We're born with a nature to serve self and make self the center to reject righteousness and sin by default. Christ, here's the point. Not just that we inherit a sin nature trend. Christ didn't have that. He was pre-wired for what? Righteousness. Pre-wired to choose righteousness, to choose his Father, to obey, to surrender his will. He was pre-wired for that. Listen, how do you think you go through 33 years of the life he lived and remain sinless? You certainly can't have a sin nature. Of course, that would have disqualified him anyway. So, his brain was pre-wired for obedience and righteous living. He had a nature to serve God, not serve himself. I can't imagine being with him. I mean, just, listen, he wasn't a little goody-two-shoes guy. Not at all. I mean, he was a man. He was a big, strong fellow. He was a carpenter. He did hard work, carried big old beams and doors, and just, he was a tough guy. And, but he was gentle, and he was kind, and he was loving, and he just automatically was that way. He was born to be that. He didn't have to overcome these temptations, and, and he was tempted from without, not from within. That can be more difficult. He was indwelt by the Spirit at birth, connected to the Father at all times, and wired to believe truth. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice? I'd be a nicer guy. I mean, if that's possible, uh, you're supposed to laugh at that kind of stuff. But yeah, thanks for the <laughs> thanks for the gratuitous laugh. Yeah. At every turn of his, listen, you got to imagine human development. Do you remember growing up? You remember being in grammar school, in middle school, or junior high, we called it, high school, and all the forces that were f swirling around you and people influencing you and you wanting to fit in and wanting to be liked and wanted and wanting to be cool or whatever it is that was your deal. I mean, you might have been one of the ascetic people that just wanted to be straight. I don't know. I didn't I never had, knew how to relate to that, but uh, <laughs> I'm still trying. Uh, he was tested and tempted in the same manner by all the challenges of life, yet without sin. His brain was pre-wired to choose righteousness and truth in contrast to fallen man. Can you see how we're not like him at all? We're not. And when the Bible tells us that we're predestined to become conformed to his to be like him in our thoughts and our emotions and our and our values and our purposes in life, that that's a great journey to go from where we start pre-wired to switch your brain over to 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 kill all these sinful pre-wired highways in your brain and shut those neurons down and rebuild righteous ones. That's an incredible journey. Only made possible. And listen, that's where 
real life comes from. It comes from that life lived. That's where joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, all this stuff that we want to be. The, pe- the things that I want to give to my family, the person I want to be, the person that they need me to be, that will, will bless them and benefit them like Christ did, this is developed through growth, through learning and applying and living. That's where we are. That's what our church is about. That's what we got to take. That's what we got to aggressively, we can't just sit here anymore. We got to aggressively go out and, and take this to the streets, the hedges and highways. That's where we're headed. So, Christ had to be impeccable to qualify as the righteous sacrifice for the sins of the world. With the precious blood of the Lamb, of a Lamb unblemished, that means no birth defects. In other words, He had no sin nature. He had no pre-wired trends towards sin. Everything was perfectly aligned as a human being should be coming off the creative hand of God. He came out of the creative hand of God as exactly the way a human being should be. Now, I'm speculating all that. The Bible doesn't say that, but it's pretty good speculation. It's pretty good. I don't think think I'm out of line to step out on that limb. And believe me, listen, I don't, maybe, you you know, when you're a preacher, you don't really know. See, in our church, ministers have to be scientists. We have to be scholars. We We have to be right. Can't just make statements based on nothing just because you had a hunch. These things have to come out of biblical logic and biblical thinking so that you've got something to base your faith on, like me. I've got to have something real to base. I don't believe anything unless I can find it and prove it here or at least strongly, strongly speculate based on facts. That's what we do. The blemish would be birth defects. He could have none of the corruption of Adam's sin. Spot, blemish and spot, were growth defects. The believing and operating on worldly ideas producing sin, which we do from the very beginning of our life. We absorb and suck in the world's ideas and other people's ideas and others' patterns and the way they operate. We copy them. We mimic them. And we end up being like them. He, he, he did that with his father. Listen, as, as, as newborn children, how, how does he say that? Ephesians 5, 1. Somebody look that up. The, and listen, the blood of Christ he's mentioning here is not literal blood. It's symbolic of the animal sacrifices performed in the Old Testament. The blood of animals was never satisfied God. It never could. Only his blood permanently satisfied the justice of God. He's our mediator. He's, our confidence is in his worthiness to be the sacrifice for sin. If he's not impeccable, sinless, pure, he can't be the sacrifice. And there is no payment of sin, and we're still under them, and we are in deep, deep trouble because there is no one else. There's no other name. And if he's truly not qualified, then what do we do? But look, you know how we know he is? He was declared the Son of God, Romans 1, 4, by his resurrection. You don't think the resurrection's important in the gospel? Good grief. Look, why would you ever not mention the resurrection? You say, well, I don't know if the resurrection is necessary for it's part of the gospel. I'm not going to fight with you. Just read the book of Acts. That's all he talks about. Uh, I mean, Luke talks about the resurrection. But lest you just mention it anyway, err on the side of caution. All right, finally, the Lord's birth, incarnation, and ultimate work has made certain the promise of redemption that we are now offered as the object of our hope, our expectation, and confidence. Before his first coming, the Old Testament believers trusted the prophecy that he would come and he would pay for the sins and he would defeat death. His birth, life, death, burial, and resurrection has fulfilled the expectations of Old Testament believers. 
This is what they were looking for, and they looked for it, they looked for it, and they looked for it, and they're like, will it ever, is it? And then Mary gets this visit. And here we go. We now look back to his incarnation and make the object of our confidence and expectation the promises of what the temporal and eternal states can be for all who not only trust him, the gospel, but surrender in our daily life and allow our minds to be renewed by replacing our old thoughts that we got from the world with the thoughts of the Scripture. See, imitating Christ is not just acting like him, behaving like him, wearing a robe with long hair. I want to read something to you because there's a lot of confusion right now in the church. Reformed theology, I got just a second, which is the idea of that God picks out of the human race who he wants to save. He sends the Holy Spirit and causes those people. He basically forces them or induces them to trust in Christ. The rest of the human race who, don't, who, who aren't chosen don't get the Holy Spirit. They're incapable of believing in Christ, but without the work of the Holy Spirit in their life to help them understand and make that step. So therefore, they go to the lake of fire. God picks and chooses himself who goes to the lake of fire. That's what, if you hear something about Reformed theology, that's, that's called hyper-Calvinism. It's really Augustinianism. Augustine's the first one that developed that idea. And it's a simple misreading of the scriptures. Uh, Gene Cunningham's got a tape series out about it. It's very good. He explains that Romans 9 through 11, where they get all that stuff, is really an explanation to Israel why they've been replaced. We've been grafted in. We've now, the, the, the divine agency is the church. But let me show you something. Romans chapter 8. Would you go there with me real quick? And I want you to see this because you're going to run into this. And I'm not suggesting that you refute them because it's just going to become an endless argument. If you want to, you can. You should study up on it, though. There's a lot of great videos on YouTube about this. Some excellent work has been done and put on there. But he says in Romans 8, chapter 8, verse 28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him. That means those who are committed to him and to his plan. Those are the ones that are looking for God to do that. See, before you get to that place, all the, quote, bad stuff that happens in your life, you let it beat you up. When you get to this place where you love God or you're committed to God, you're fully committed to this thing, you've surrendered yourself to it, then you begin to see that what he's allowing is meant to create great blessing in your life, growth. But he says, those who are called according to his purpose, we spoke of that earlier, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Now, you would think if, if what they say is true, that they would be predestined to get saved, right? He's predestined them to get saved. It's not true. He's predestined them to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. The predestination has to do with the transformation process that we all enter into at the point of salvation. He's talking about the change. And the point is, when you get to heaven, you're going to be fully changed. Snap. Resurrection body, perfect soul, ready to go. Past the judgment seat. But look, the point is, you started that at the point of salvation, and you're, the goal is to get as far along that road as you can in this life. Learning, changing, growing, developing, erasing and replacing, developing this spiritual life and serving out of it, serving him out of it. Let's close in prayer.
I, I challenge you this Christmas to put your hope in what's coming and what that meant when he was born, the assurance, I mean, the final, the renewing of their hope, their confidence, because he finally came. And now what we have ahead of us. He, Paul says that I don't count anything that we suffer here to be compared, comparable to the glory, to the blessing that's waiting on us. Nothing we go through here is even worthy to mention in regard to where we're going. So we'll pray. Father, I do thank you so much for these words, for this insight and understanding. Uh, I thank you for giving me the uh, resilience and the determination over 40 years to learn these things, for this gift to be able to speak them and say them in simple terms. I pray the people could have heard this, the emphasis in the right place, the understanding of the hope based on your promises, the fact that we can look to the future if it's even five minutes or, or 500 years and know that we're in your plan, that, you're, that we got it made. We're in it, that we're in a war we're going to win. The blessing is there waiting on us. I pray that we focus on those things this year and that we share that with our loved ones. I thank you so much for everything, Father. Uh, we do ask that you bless the offering, the money that comes, that it will go to support the ministries and the, and the work that we do here. In Christ's name we pray, amen.